Hi, and welcome to this episode of Shop Miscellanea. This time around, I'm going to look at a, some recent acquisitions and check out some indicators. One I got back from repair, another brand new one of the same manufacturer and make and model, and a third one from a less expensive vendor like Shars. But first up, I had to replace my super glue, and I was looking on Amazon for various sources and ran across this Star Brand uh, super glue. And I thought as long as I was at it, I might as well get different viscosity super glue. Uh, this, as you can see, this one comes in thin, thick, and medium and thick. Uh, super glues that are higher viscosity, like this thick one over here, have better gap filling properties. Although, let's be honest, super glue is not the best gap filling glue out there. It's not really known for it. So even the thick, you, you really have to have a reasonably tight fit. The beauty of what I discovered, and the reason I'm sharing it, is because this kit from Starbond was actually cheaper than buying all the things individually by a fair amount. So I'll put a link down below in case you're interested. Uh, it's nice because not only do they have the three viscosity superglues, they have the accelerator, and they have all the uh, accessory applicator tip. Included in each one of these individual kits are two individual caps with lids that seal pretty nicely. And if you notice internally, they have an internal and an external sealing surface, or the top sealing surface and an internal sealing surface, probably trying to keep moisture out. Um, the super glue that's sealed from the factory and some micro applicator tips, as well as a cleaning tip. It's got to see the little needle in there. A uh, cleaning tip for these applicator tips themselves, because inevitably, even if you're doing the best job you can, they're eventually going to clog up if you don't use the super glue all at one time. Pretty handy. Each one of these little kits also comes with a little instruction pamphlet here, which is incredibly useful. Useful. They're talking about things that'll slow down your drying of the uh, super glue. One is the formulation itself. Some super glues are designed to cure more slowly than others. Uh, low surface energy parts will cure more slowly and not stick as well. That's like super smooth plastics, a lot like the bottle they put it, the super glue in itself, designed so it doesn't stick to it. High surface energy parts are things like balsa wood or roughed up materials that have uh, a lot of nooks and crannies where the super glue can bond to, but also the atomic surface structure. I uh, can't ignore that at all. Slippery plastics are not a good match for super glue. Uh, if you put too much glue, it's also going to cure fairly slowly. Cold temperatures or acidic environments. Interestingly enough, people have been using baking soda as a quick, uh, a quick accelerant for a long time, and that's because it's basic. Basic environments make super glue cure more quickly. And when you're storing it, they recommend storing the refrigerator. Hey, thanks guys for all the tips. Everyone's saying, hey, put it in your, your refrigerator. I did keep my Loctite in the refrigerator that was that special modified super glue with the black rubber particles in it. But I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that everything should be stored in the refrigerator. These guys even say in the freezer, store away from heat. Uh, also, smaller volume cures more quickly. So large volume's good, low quality, or really old manufacturing lines will make your super glue harden on you um, in the bottle much more likely. There's a lot more useful tips inside here, so if you want to check this out, I got a link down below so you can find this kit. Next up is a really weird acquisition. I uh, often sit low to the ground when I'm working on things, other projects other than just machining in my workshop, and I don't have anything low to sit on, and leaning over is really rough on my back. So I was looking for a small stool, except I don't have anywhere to store more furniture in this shop. I have a couple chairs and everything is so full that even the chairs have stuff stacked on top of them. So I was looking for a small stool that I could like slide in somewhere, ran across this thing. Check this out. Hold your fingers side to side here. And you've got a stool that supposedly supports 400 pounds. It supports me no problem. And the height is adjustable, interestingly enough. So you twist to unlock these, and if you want to lock it at a certain height, you can. You don't have to go all the way open. That is a really handy little tool, and it stores in a package this big. There's not much else to say about it other than it's very functional as a stool, does exactly what it's supposed to do. The price was very reasonable. This might be what you're looking for. They even have versions that have a little cushion on top if you need that. Next up, I showed you these soft jaw inserts I 3D printed a while back. This is a 10-inch 
uh, four jaw chuck. It is a bison. And I 3D printed these four jaw uh, chuck adapters that would allow you to hold a brass pin to turn them into soft jaws uh, in front of the jaw face. So the plastic part, all it does is hold this brass piece in place long enough for you to tighten it down. If you'll notice, or maybe you can't see, but on the back side, these are actually really quite tight. On the back side of these guys, it's just the open jaw face. I guess you can maybe see in there. And that's just the open jaw face. So when you actually tighten down a part, It'll press the brass against the jaw face. The plastic doesn't have to do any of the hard work here. However, as you'll notice, I already lost one of the brass pins here. Why is that? Because I printed these out of PLA and PLA will creep on you. So initially I just left these on, these soft jaws on, on the jaws themselves. And when I came back, all of these pins were inside there. And the reason for it is because the PLA slowly creeped and stretched out over time and now they don't hold the pins in place, which the only point of these plastic parts is to hold the pins in place. And if they can't do that, they're pretty worthless. So I reprinted them in a different material, PETG, modified the uh, design a little bit. These have a stop for the pins to pin the, prevent the pins from sliding out the bottom anyways. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get these guys on there and see if they work better. By the way, on this design, I put a set screw in back. I put a hole and you just run a tap through it and thread it in real quick to hold against the back in case these would slip off. That has never been a problem. These are such a snug fit. You actually have to pry them off with a screwdriver. The set screws I used weren't regular set screws because even though the jaws are hardened on my four jaw chuck, I didn't want to risk damaging them. So I used uh, set screws with brass inserts on them hard to see. Uh, once you get them all the way down, I'm already, it's already so tight, it's hard to get off. And I have to end up taking a screwdriver under the bottom here and gently prying them off. So that's not a problem. The set screw's uh, unnecessary, but my new ones have the option of a set screw. I just don't think I'm gonna need to put them on. Because once you, you tap that guy in, it's not going anywhere. And the advantage of PETG is that it doesn't creep like PLA does. So this was a poor choice of materials on my part. Plus, this little bottom piece right here will prevent the pin from sliding down, even if it does expand too much, although this will be sideways, not vertical like it is now. Once the brass is in the PETG, it's already so tight. I'm having a hard time getting it out. Uh, but you don't have to worry about the pins pushing back into the throat of your lathe, uh, the spindle. I actually had that problem too. I had one of these pins fall in behind and then I had to try and get out, which ultimately required me to take the chuck off. That was a total pain. So these are not going to suffer from the same problem. And that's it. That's a little update on these guys. Uh, again, I'm not going to need this uh, threaded portion. If anyone is interested in the 3D model for this, I can make it available for you. Uh, you probably need a very similar chuck because dimensions are probably, you know, about the same. But you can also steal my design, feel free. Next up, if you've been watching my channel long enough, you've probably seen me use this guy. This is a Jacob spindle nose ch uh, lathe chuck. And it fits collets that are very interesting. They're rubber flex collets. So they have hardened piece of, uh, pieces of steel inset in them in between the rubber and so you can squeeze the rubber slightly and the steel parts are what grip the actual part itself uh, when you put it in here so that fits in there and then when you tighten it down all of those steel bits close easier to do this on the lathe these are hard to find and very useful and they go up very large too uh, you can hold parts up to one and three quarters in these uh, collet sets and you can see the uh, rubber closing down and squeezing the metal bits towards the middle. It does a pretty good job with concentricity and uh, they have larger range than 5C collets by a huge amount. So they're very handy, especially for quick work. This is a lot like the Atlas speed chuck I have for 5C collets, except they go much larger than the 5Cs do. Uh, if anyone's interested, uh, I haven't used this in a long time. Uh, the work I do just hasn't seemed to uh, need this sort of thing. So I'm actually gonna put this up for sale on eBay and I have 
three collet sets. This one goes all the way down to 16th to 5 eighths, 5 eighths to 1 and 3 eighths with a spare set of 5 eighths to 1 and 3 eighths. So it'll be a really nice set. And if you're looking for it, it'll be on eBay. I'll put the link down below for you. One last thing, because there always seems to be one last thing. Uh, the mount is D16. So normally D16 has six pins, but this only uses three of the six to hold it onto the, the, uh, the face of the spindle. So by the way, if you're a viewer of this channel and you're interested in this collet chuck and all the collets, only one of the stops is uh, in the kit. The rest were missing for some reason. Um, but if you're interested in this kit, I'll give you a better deal than what I'm selling it for on eBay. So if you let me know uh, when you're purchasing it, I'll give you some of your money back. Next up, I have this indexing head, this rotary indexing head, and it's a Yuasa, and it's old Yuasa, so it's actually made in Japan. It's extremely smooth uh, motion. It tilts. As you can see, the head rotates here and tilts. It comes with a faceplate for a chuck right here. And it only has the one indexing wheel plus another one that the person who sold this to me made. This looks like a handmade uh, indexing wheel. It also has a key for that'll probably work on some mills, I'm guessing, that fits in the slot on the bottom to line up to speed things up. And that is ground. That is a really good fit. So if this works with your mill, then you're set. It's in excellent condition. And again, I'm selling this on eBay. So if you are interested and you find my auction, um, let me know in the auction after you've bought it and I'll give you a discount off of the price. Next up is this Bison three jaw chuck. I picked this up for the next tool I bought because I wanted a three jaw chuck for it. This is a Bison made in Poland, five inch chuck. And unlike a lot of the, uh, the Chinese ones that are really inexpensive, this is a precision ground chuck that you don't need to take apart and clean the moment you get it because some care was taken in its manufacture. So this is gonna go with the next tool that I got that was a really lucky find. I wanted that chuck for this tool. Now, granted, I want a sl wanted a slightly larger chuck, but beggars can't be choosers. And when this guy came up for sale, this is a Yawasa rotary indexer. I believe this one's made in Taiwan. I'll have to check when I open it up. This is brand new and I got it for a tiny fraction of what the new one actually sells for. So it was an incredible deal that I couldn't pass up. And so now I've got that other one available and I wanted a chuck for this guy. So I found that little bison. I, w I wanted bigger than the five inch, but you know, like I said, beggars can't be chooser. It's a bison versus one of the Asian ones that's just sort of so, so that you got to rework. This rotary indexing head is the complete kit. Comes with three indexing plates pre-drilled, it comes with the center, the drive dog, and a faceplate for a chuck. So this will support a six or maybe even an eight inch chuck on this guy. Plus it also includes the tailstock, which is adjustable and extremely well made. This was a really good find and I got it for almost, only a little bit more than just that other one on eBay. I don't know why the person was selling it. I guess they needed to get out of it in a hurry because it was the deal of a lifetime and I obviously couldn't pass it up. So I took him up on it. So I've got this guy. The only negative for me is this guy is a lot heavier. And that's actually a huge factor for me in my decisions to uh, buying tools. I try and find tools that don't make my back go out when I move them. Uh, and I don't have easy place for a hoist in my shop. So that severely limits me. But this is the Yuasa kit as purchased. Very, very nice. Very pleased to have it. Hopefully we'll show some upcoming videos when I uh, try and do some gears. So last up, I've got a set of three dial indicators here. The first one was my go-to indicator on my lathe and I had to send it off to MR Tool Repair because I bent the shaft. You know, when you have it mounted to your cross slide and you're moving across a part, if you forget to suck it in when there's something that is sticking out, it takes almost no force at all to bend this at all. Uh, it was a tiny, uh, it was barely moving and it crushed it, but you can see the outstanding job MR Tool Repair did. If you're wondering uh, about where to send your broken indicators and things, 
Mark Bertowski is fantastic at what he does. I highly recommend him. I've used him before. And uh, anyways, he uh, apparently the new shaft came with a different tip because he sent back my original, or no, I guess he sent back the tip that came on it. And this was the original tip on my indicator. So what I want to do is I bought an another because I couldn't live without it. I needed a backup in case I damaged this one again because I'm just that bunch of much of a knucklehead. Uh, so I was wanted to compare these two, and then I bought an inexpensive one from Shars simply to see how it performed. Because we all know Shars Tools is a great supplier of inexpensive tooling all the way up to brands like Michitoyo and Starrett uh, tooling uh, for the hobbyist community, and they've always been very supportive. And so I very much appreciate them. So I bought this one to test just to see how good it was. So I'm kind of interested to see how these indicators are shipped, see if it's different. Indi Mitch Toy used to send them all in a plastic box. That is no more. They do have a sheet where they show how linear it is, how much it varies off of ideal as it goes through its whole range of motion, uh, which is very interesting, certificate of inspection. So it's just a form case now and a really inexpensive cardboard box. So here is the brand new one next to my older one. This is an A version. That is a non-A version. It looks like this is plastic with a locking piece. This is plastic with a locking piece. Oh, that's really interesting. There is a little more friction pushing back on the brand new one than the old one that Mark rebuilt. Before, the real problem is if you bend these even slightly, when you push them in and then the part comes away from it, it won't go back, it'll stick. And that's what was happening. So the old design is pretty straightforward. It's a bent piece of metal that matches the profile of the side. And when you tighten it down, it just presses against the plastic ever so slightly. Doesn't do a particularly good job of locking it off. It's okay. Uh, this is the only kind of thing you'd want to use like in a qualifying lab or something like that, where you need to set preset something and then measure a bunch of components and make sure it doesn't change. For me, I always want this adjustable, so I leave it loose. The new one is a very interesting design. They have dovetails on two sides of this guy. And this thing slides over the dovetails, I think in this direction here. And it's an okay lock like the other one. You can switch sides if you have a preference, which is uh, an interesting addition. I guess if you have some fixture where it won't fit well, that could be useful. However, since this part slides off and on so easily when it's loose, I'd say it's gonna get lost because I would leave this loose all the time and it falls off, I think I prefer the old design to the new design because I'm never going to leave this guy on. Let's take a look at the Shars. So the Shars box is very similar to the Michu Toyo, except they used, I think this is expanded polystyrene. This one also comes with a test of how linear it is. It's a beautiful indicator, I got to say the aesthetics wise and it shows how much it varies across its range of motion so one inch or 25.4 millimeters it varies by as much as 15 microns there is that no 19 microns worst case 19 microns is 0.019 millimeters 0.019 millimeters divided by 25.4 is about seven tenths. So the worst case scenario, this indicator is off by seven tenths. This one, this max up here is three thousandths. And I can't actually tell, oh, well they spec it up here. Five tenths uh, for full, all 10 revolutions for one inch. According to that, this, this one's almost its equal. I'd like to actually test that. I'm gonna start with the Michu Koyo indicator. All right, so here's my setup. We have a half inch gauge block since that is where the Michu Toyo is supposedly the least accurate. 
And if I go up or down from there, it should read a little bit under what the appropriate value is. So for example, if I went up 50 thousandths, it should read 49 and change thousandths. So we have the half inch gauge block here. I've zeroed it. Let me see if it, it'll repeat. That's important and it does repeat. Let's add a tenth of an inch to this. And as they said in the Michitoyo manual, you will notice it is just under uh, 0.6. So the small dial here went up from 0.5 to 0.6. That is just under, and there, they said it would read under. Let's add, I can't add another, oh yeah, I can do, I don't have a two tenths here. Let's do 250, 250,000. So it should be down here somewhere. That one's actually better. It is still maybe a tenth under, but that's about it. Here is 0.9. And again, it reads slightly under, this time by about half a thousandth. So for 0.9, it reads 0.8995. All right, here we are with the shards at right on half an inch. I'm trying to give you minimal parallax on this guy by getting this lined up straight in line. So that's zero and it repeats. So let's go to the first size, which would be 0.6. And that reads maybe a tenth over, which is what they said they would. So they actually, either these things are all similar and they're off by the same amount, or they actually do measure them. Next size would be 0.75. That one looks like half a thousandth over. Oh yeah, that's about two tenths over. That's all. Point that read point seven five zero two. Next one. Here we are at one extreme, and look at that. It's about two tenths over. This is point nine, and it's reading point nine zero zero two. Point nine zero zero two. So better than their sheet spec. I give Char's a huge thumbs up on this, and it's repeatable. It comes right back. That's absolutely fantastic. This Char's indicator, it reads high, the Mitchu Toyo reads low, and I'd say they're every bit as good as each other. That's amazing. This indicator, the Char's, I'll give a link to it, but the Char's cost, I forget, 20, 30 bucks. This was over 100. Well, that was a really interesting test because the Char's indicator performed every bit as nicely as the Mitchu Toyo. I guess one thing you don't know is like how long how well this is going to last long term but this this is the my older uh, Michu Toyo and it reads low just like the new one does apparently that's sort of standard with them and the Shars reads high and that's standard with those I'm guessing they don't measure each indicator although Shars tries to give you the idea that they did and maybe they did I'm not going to call them liars uh, in their factory but I wonder if this is just standardized so they've got a correction curve so you can actually correct based on what you're reading is what the real value should be. But most people wouldn't use a thousandths indicator to read accurate tenths. So I think they did plenty good job. I'm very, very pleased. And that's it. Thanks for watching. Hope you find it useful. Hope to see you next time.